Hello everybody, this is the Chrises, and we have Almarissa, Chrissy, Driel, and Fawn who are presenting Building a Reparenting-Focused Community. So first, a little bit of notes and disclaimers. So, as a plural-centric session, unless we explicitly say otherwise, we're talking about internal people, not external. So we're going to talk about reparenting children in your system, and there will be a few mentions of external physical world children. And by older children, we mean approximately school-aged inner children, and we'll state explicitly when we mean an external physical child, teen, or adult. We're going to make a very strong case for reparenting your young system members internally. So I want to take a moment to say that the views expressed in our presentation are our own, and they're cumulative of our experiences with our own system and many other systems, listening to heartbreaking stories where um, people have had external people reparent system members and system children, and it went very wrong. And um, we've come up with ways that we think wholeheartedly believe that are much better in practice. Um, but if you're currently in a relationship with an external parental figure, please don't feel guilty about or ashamed that you have done so because it's normal to want your children to be parented by someone, and it's fully possible to start a transition phase of overlapping parental care internally with whatever you have on, going on externally right now. So you can either eventually disengage from external parental attachments, or you can continue a co-parenting relationship with an external. It's your choice. Um, but you can start making some changes now in order to prevent additional vulnerability or having all of your eggs in one basket, if you will, um, later on. So just take good care of yourselves. Try not to take it too personally if we say something that might annoy you. Um, and keep healthy attachments or responsibility, um, or, or take responsibility in uh, carefully disengaging from unhealthy ones. What do we mean by reparenting? Or reparenting in selves reliance? Um, reparenting is the act of taking control of healing a parental relationship and, and internally. And what do we mean um, by selves reliance? So we we believe that that your system is in its own way like a whole and complete group entity, if you will, that you have um, an internal dynamic group who can work together and fulfill roles for each other within without having to go outside. So being selves-reliant would be as a group entity or as a full plural system where you work with your system and get as many of your needs met internally as possible without needing to rely on externals. Obviously, you know, we rely on farmers to help us eat. You know, we're not talking about a lack of interdependence, but we are talking about a lack of dependence. So how does ASOAV fit in or as inside, so outside and vice versa? There are a lot of parallels between things in the external world and things going on in the inside world. So, for example, there are people who need parental guidance externally, and there are people who need parental guidance internally. So there are these ways that the external world and the internal world mirror each other. What's going on inside is not completely alien to the external world. People may think that it's like, oh my god, it's so weird that you have all these people inside of one body, and it's like, no, it's a lot like a commune or a frat house or <laughs> a dormitory or, you know, like any other kind of communal living situation, except that the communal living situation is in a body instead of a house. It's not that different. Um, happens to be a bunch of people with trauma, usually, 
and that can add some complexity to it, or the shared resources of one body. It's like having 20 roommates or something, you know, and you have sh you have one bathroom and 20 roommates. That doesn't work so well, right? So you have, like, limited resources. So one thing that's useful about ASOAV, and I often will look at a situation and say, well, what external stuff can we borrow to work with for internal stuff? So we're going to borrow things like external role models. Um communities, parental figures, childhood development experts or materials. And we're going to bring some of that stuff to see how it works and whether it works with our internal system. That's what I've done for this. One of the other ways, because the, uh, the vice versa part, how can working on reparenting ourselves do things for the external world? So being better internal parents can also help some of us who have external physical children be better external parents. So if we take care of our own needs internally, we won't put that on our kids or we'll have better idea of what our kids are capable of outside of our body because we're working with the kids inside of our body. So what's the problem? <laughs> Why do we even need reparenting in the first place? So we end up with stuck people internally. We have stuck infants, stuck children, uh, teenagers, adults who still need role modeling and support from a parental figure. Just like external parents don't just disappear the minute you turn into an adult, you know, they still have to be there and there are kids still living at home when they're 40. Just because there may be adults inside doesn't mean they don't need reparenting as well. And that goes for physical people too. Physical, singular people also sometimes need reparenting. So this is, this is just part of the human condition to need reparenting. So some of the reasons we might need it is perhaps we have some deep insecurity or the foundations of our emotional security aren't there and we're not great judges of who to trust to get our needs met. Sometimes our most vulnerable system members, like the youngest children, um, need help to stay safe and be nurtured and attended to, and we should do so at all reasonable costs. We don't want to betray them again because they've already been betrayed. We'll talk a little bit more about that. The risk of re-traumatization. So um, one of the reasons we need to reparent is to protect those children so that they don't get re-traumatized. If uh, inner children get re-traumatized, it sets everybody back, um, especially the children, and it can build more barriers and distrust and both inside and outside of the system. So you don't want more barriers, you don't want more amnesia, and so on. So you don't want to have your inner children traumatized. A lack of trust, because we've been through repeated trauma, and had unreliable um, caregivers. Not, not all of us, but most of us who need reparenting have had trauma and unreliable caregivers. We may not have learned how to properly trust people, especially ourselves. If we were unreliable because, you know, we may have been re unreliable because our role models were. So reparenting can help heal and repair the damage done when parenting failed the first go around, but it's vital to minimize the potential for re-traumatization. There's no definitive end for reparenting. We don't really know whether or not any particular child in our system will age up or how long it will take them to get there or whether they will ever really be truly 100% self-sufficient. So a five-year-old won't just need 20 years of ex you know external time um, of reparenting to get to 25. It could happen very quickly, or it could take the rest of your life. We just don't know. Um, <laughs> and so reparenting is a commitment and a labor of love and compassion uh, to help everybody in your system. And well cared for internal folk usually will age up, but there's no guarantees. And if they're stuck, it isn't a reflection on your parenting skills. Some people t 
turn to externals as parental figures, and that can cause problems. If uh, you know, if we can, we're going to go over some of the problems. So one problem is that there is scarcity of fronting time, and many people run into this problem with or without um, children in their system who want to spend time with their parental figures. Um, but if your parental figures are external, then those children are going to want and need front time in order to get time with their parental figures. So what happens when those children go back inside and their parents are on the outside, they're external, so they go inside, now they're parentless. And little children and infants and, and toddlers can't be separated from their parents that way. It doesn't work. So if the parents are inside, that resolves that part of the issue. It makes them available to monitor and spend time with the children even when they're not fronting. Externals can't reliably reparent your inner kids because they have their own external life, their, their work, their vacations, dreams and goals. They have their own physical children and partners, and um, maybe even they have other people in your system that they have a relationship with, so it's not fair for them to make this commitment to be there all the time for this little child and then also have another life, if you will. At the same time, external people are going to have real life interruptions. So no matter how well-meaning they are, no matter how much they really mean that they're going to be there for you 24-7, 365, they can retire if it's a professional. They can move away. They can get sick or become disabled. Um, they can underestimate the time commitment because, as we said before, we don't know how long that person's going to be a child. And, and at worst, you know, you might need to break up with them for various reasons, or they might die. Um, and this has happened where somebody lost a parental figure this way. So your system's already dealt with enough pain and adversity, and we don't really want to see that happen to people anymore. <laughs> so it's, it's a time for healing and not life lessons. Like somebody might say, well, you know, that's just life. Yeah, but we've already had those lessons and they're going to happen regardless of setting ourselves up for a situation where it might happen again. But when those situations happen externally and you lose a loved one or they move, a friend moves away or whatever, let the adults deal with it and not have it impact the children as much. I mean, you know, they might be losing a friend, but imagine the difference between losing a friend, an adult friend, versus losing a parent. Very, very different. External people can't really discipline your internal children the same way you can. Hard for them to take away screen time or, you know, any anything like they're kind of they would kind of be telling you there's a punishment or a, a restriction for your inner kids and then you'd have to carry it out, but you don't have the authority because you're not the parent. It, it would be really weird to be trying to have an external person discipline your internals. So what usually happens is they end up being a permissive parent. We'll talk a little bit about that later. So they usually end up being very, very permissive, um, which doesn't give children good structure. And sometimes it actually leads to more insecurity. Children need some kind of structure and discipline, some kind of rules to follow. And somebody who's going to make sure that those rules are enforced I'm not saying anything about cruelty here, just this is what kids need. If kids are flopping around and have no limits, they get insecure and anxious. They they don't like, when they're really young, they don't like a world, you know, an entire world being open to them. They really want a more restricted environment to help keep them safe and keep them close to their parents, if you will. Unfortunately, there are people out there with bad intentions and so having external people reparent your internals can be a vector for external abusers. This is the primary reason that this is so important. 
that that we bring this work to you and that's why it's so important to do the reparenting in-house. This allows you to have healthier boundaries and um, work on having healthy relationships with external people and protect your inner children from them at the same time. And it, sometimes we want or need to believe that people really mean the best for us and are trustworthy, but we make mistakes. And so on top of there being some very active predators out there, um, we just really want you to keep your kids safe and keep your whole system away from bad people and external who winnows their way into your system in that way. And then turns out, oh my goodness, we need to separate ourselves from them. You can end up with a tug of war inside, um, or even being sabotaged. You can separate from the person and then the kid fronts and the kid goes back to them because the kid misses their parent. Eh, not good. <laughs> Let's not go there. Another issue when you have your own relationship with an external person is that switching context can be very confusing and sometimes there can be really big mistakes. Uh, the one we don't care for too much is when it's like, say, a spouse. So you have an intimate physical relationship with your spouse and you may say things that are different with your spouse and if they turn around and say something and you've switched it may be inappropriate for them to have said to your child you know that that there can be these kinds of mishaps or boundary violations or inappropriate behavior or inappropriate touch or switching at the wrong time because the child wants to be with their parent it's not easy to lock them away someplace so that you can have safe adult time if the child really, really wants to be with their parent. So it's safer not to have that kind of relationship and tempt the child to take over at inopportune moments. And there are good people in the world who just want to help out, you know, and they're eager and they, they may really like your kids or be you know, falling in love with them, you know, like, oh, I love them, or they're so cute, or whatever. And they can be helpful, um, but the best way for them to help is really by helping your adults be better parents. Um, and they can be friends with your kids, you know, there's no reason they can't color in a coloring book or play with clay or whatever with the kids, but there would be restrictions on that. Anything that a friend of a parent shouldn't do, should not be done with your kids, you know, no long hugs and cuddling and things like, no, 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 <laughs> no, not really, not appropriate, um, thank you, they'll get that from, from their parents, you know. You can draw lines and you can have safe boundaries and we'll talk more about that. Who might be a good system to work on a reparenting focused community? If you want to be self-reliant and take care of yourselves in a healthy and mature way, this can be a good way to help healing and empowerment, help raise the entire system's maturity level as a group entity. If you are ready for a do-over and not have um, unreliable, abusive caregivers, then this is an excellent idea for you. If you're willing to make this a major priority internally, we're not sure what goes on if you only give this kind of half of your all. It's, it's kind of got to be like wholeheartedly several of you have really bought into the idea and really want to work together on this. It's, it's a project. And it's a project without an, a definite end. Um, although as, as the children grow up, which hopefully they will, can't guarantee it, can't say how long it'll be. But as they grow up, the load does lighten. Um, as they get more capable and need less supervision, it frees up more of your time, just like physical world parents do. It frees up more of your time and energy. You don't necessarily need as many people watching them at the same time, you know, and things like that. So it frees up more um, space for your, your internal parenting group to have more free time and more leeway with what they can do. You probably want to be internally ready, which requires some level of self-awareness and some level of co-consciousness in order to deal with the children. It doesn't have to be 
100%, but it does have to be enough to monitor them and, as a group, keep them in a safe place. If you already have good internal teamwork um, and you have a team that's already interested, that's going to help. So any kind of a reliable team that already exists could become the team that does this. And if you're not ready, but you still want to do this, then you can work on steps in order to, you know, start getting ready and make that a priority. So the challenges of this for some of us are things like understanding childhood development. Especially for traumatized systems, we don't have a very good or accurate idea of developmental milestones or what's age appropriate for children. Maybe weird expectations were put on us because our role models didn't have a good idea of good developmental milestones, or perhaps we didn't hit the de developmental milestones. It doesn't matter. But whatever it is, generally speaking, a lot of us don't really know parenting and, and age appropriate um, childhood behavior and and things like that, like uh, how to discipline or um, what are good chores for a child to do at that age and things like that. We just don't know. Um, so learning those milestones can be a little bit of a challenge because as we look at those milestones, it may bring up things from our past that we remember or bring up um, more trauma issues. So while this is going on, we may discover more trauma in ourselves as adults in the system. It can also, as we become conscious of, of trauma, can build up some resentment between, between us and the people outside, our external caregivers who neglected us. Like we might remember things that we didn't before, <laughs> or realize that maybe our childhood wasn't uh, as peachy as we thought it was. And then also sometimes we can find ourselves having enforced expectations or discipline that's inappropriate given a headmate's age. So we have to kind of own up to it and make corrections. You know, we learn about a developmental milestone. It's like, oh my goodness, I've been expecting too much of you. We also have a tendency to be hard on ourselves. So we need realistic goals and milestones as close to ideal as possible, but we also have to forgive ourselves for the mistakes or any disability and get back to our role as an internal parent. So admitting our mistakes, apologizing, revising boundaries and rules as needed, communicating with everybody involved. So we may have no good prior parental role models, so we need to look for some amazing role models to emulate. Uh, we may have some folks in mind, and it doesn't have to be uh, emulating only one person. Like, we don't need to look for the whole package. We, we can pick and choose traits, behaviors, values, attitudes from myriad sources, including external world people, headmates, or even fictional sources, as long as they have what we believe are good parenting, uh, good parental behavior. Babies and preschoolers. So even though they get more independent as they get older, these children are so young, they need a lot of time and attention and focus. But since they can't be front all the time, um, I want to address, there's a little bit of a myth that uh, your internal children can't grow in the inner world and that they need to go front in order to grow. Not everybody believes this, but for some reason, this, this goes around that somehow they need to front in order to process stuff in order to grow up. No. And frankly, once you stop believing the myth and they get their needs met in the internal world and they come out only with supervision, you know, if that's, that would be a goal. I mean, you may not have that ability at first, but you want it so that the only times they go front, they have a parent figure at their shoulder, watching over them, making sure that their behavior in the external world is appropriate. Once they're properly cared for, once they are um, sheltered appropriately and loved appropriately, they can start healing and developing without endangering your external stability in your life. If you're holding down a job, you don't want your little coming out while you're at work 
you know, and so on and so forth. So if things are being handled, if those needs are being met internally, they are less likely to act out and come out and disrupt things. It, it can be very good to help stabilize your life. Choosing between parental style or parenting styles. There's, there are several that are recognized, um, written down on paper. So one of the things I want to say about actually choosing them is that, that there's no ideal parenting style and making mistakes is completely normal. I can't mention any parent who's a hundred percent perfect. If they're too, they're overprotective, if they, if they, you know, shelter somebody, then they're too protective and the person's, you know, gets stifled. If they're too permissive and, it, you know, it's a constant balancing act. There are some parenting styles that are better suited than others or better suited to specific children. So really parenting at all without being abusive is what's really most important, um, caring and being present and so on. So the different styles work in different circumstances with different children. Some children may need a blend of styles or different styles at different times. And it's okay if you find that one parental headmate uh, works with a specific child better than with another. Just make sure to rotate responsibility so everybody gets a break. So I'm not sure about everybody else here, but um, we have the, if we want something done right, we have to do it ourselves problem. <laughs> uh, yeah. So the wonderful thing is that as a group, we bring many different nuances to parenting our children. So it's good to have some overall guidelines that are consistent, but we bring our own parenting styles to the table. Um, and deal with our, our children a little differently. Kids are adaptable in that way. They can deal with, you know, one parent is allergic to peanuts, another one isn't, and things like, you know, whatever it is. They can deal with some differences. So long as there's a baseline that's consistent, the style being different is okay. So make sure that you all agree on the important stuff, like boundaries, responsibilities, discipline, privileges, and that you meet to exchange information about what's going on, you know, to get caught up and communicate frequently so that you can head off any problems before they get bad. And always have a backup or an on-call person um, or somebody, you know, multiple people on, um, on duty at the same time so that somebody can take over if anything goes wrong. We don't schedule our parenting um, resource room, or what do you want to call it? We don't schedule our childcare. We just have, usually have several adults watching at the same time in the nursery because we have several kids in there and they're quite young. So we have like three or four um, adults at various times going in and out of the room. Somebody needs a pee break. It's okay. You know, things like that. Um, so don't put all the responsibility on one person. Rotate childcare between even all of the adults in your system, but as many of them as you can, and possibly even older teens who are very responsible and, you know, can be like older siblings or maybe like aunts or uncles. But it's better to have too many, I think, than too few caregivers. Uh, but even if there's only two adults in your system and everybody else's kids, that'll do. And, you know, absolutely... If there's only one of you, you're going to do your best, you know, just like any single parent does. You just do your best. So do your best, back each other up, and we're sure it's going to be orders of magnitude better than having somebody external care for your little ones. So here's a list of some parenting styles that have been identified in literature. A few of these are I guess more popular and some of these are kind of like offshoots, but these are some of the known. Permissive is somebody who gives a lot of permission. Authoritarian is much more on the discipline end of the spectrum. Authoritative is I'm the parent, you're going to do what I say, but not being 
as restrictive as the authoritarian. You know, it's my way or the highway uh, is authoritarian. Authoritative is, no, I'm sorry, I'm the adult, you have to listen to me. Permissive is, okay, <laughs> go ahead. Hands off would be, it's, n it's not even free range. Free range is um, trusting the kids to kind of monitor themselves. Uh, there are times for these, not always, but there are times for them. But as, as many things, it's good to have a mixed diet of various things. If your child does something dangerous and inappropriate, you might become authoritative. If um, your kid just is not following the rules or doing their chores, you might be authoritarian. There are times you might be permissive about something. Yeah, sure, you can have a sleepover party. It's only the people in my head anyway. <laughs> Go ahead, have a sleepover party. Um, <laughs> whatever it is. So these are um, some of them. And I, I have um, authoritative parenting style is setting up an internal community where the adults work with the children to set reasonable rules, but the adults are in charge of enforcing and ensuring that the children abide by the rules and that the rules are safe and age appropriate. These can be regarded as a supervised democracy where there is a citizen class that is given guided voting rights based on their level of responsibility. So authoritative is what we do. Our children get a vote in our system. We listen to them. We take whatever they say into account and they're allowed to debate with us. And I kind of guess I raised my external kids that way too. And then there's attachment parenting style. Now, uninvolved, that, you know, between hands-off and uninvolved, we're getting too kind of neglectful. I, I wouldn't say that those are the best, but you can read up on these. They're available online, and you can, you can get an idea of what the menu looks like. And maybe decide there are times when hands-off is appropriate or uninvolved is appropriate. Um, maybe one of you is uninvolved and somebody else is involved, you know? So anyway... Um, but the attachment style is another interesting one that sometimes gets a bad rap. We see it as appropriate for early, early childhood. Um, and not so much for the, for the older children or teenagers. So attachment parenting style is where you're the safe roost. It's especially beneficial for very young and traumatized children. So being additionally sensitive to the children's needs, available and consistent, the adult is in charge, sets boundaries, but allows child, um, the child age-appropriate activities and independence while being available for check-ins and reassurance as needed. So it's kind of like you're a nest. And so you're in the room and present even though the child is going about and doing their own thing. And whenever the child wants, you stop whatever you're doing. You know, you stop reading Facebook or whatever, and you give them the hug they want or you you know, hand them their sippy cup or whatever, and then they go off and play again when they're ready. Um, they may come over and cuddle for 10 minutes and then walk off again. Um, but whatever it is, you're, you're just making yourself available. It gets critiqued because being so available limits the adult's freedom. But since we have, in our system anyway, we have so many people in the room, we're more able to give this level to our really young children. You know, if they want a hug, we're right there. If they need a kiss for their boo-boo knee, they get it um, <laughs> and stuff. So we do this um, with our very young children. Let's see, the parent is also there to coach, comfort, and guide the child when there are consequences for things that happen. The style allows the child to sleep with you if they want to or need to, or after they have a nightmare, and to have this internal style uh, make sure that there are several dedicated parent figures in your system so that folk can take breaks while still being attentive to the children's needs, like I said. And as the child relaxes and gains confidence, then the parental, um, parental unit, the, the parents in the system can remain available and attentive as needed. And it can then ease more into the authoritative style as the child gets older and more confident. So how do you build a good reparenting environment in order to implement the solutions that we're gonna talk about later? So this is kind of, how do you build the nest from which you can, you can provide this nurturing environment? 
Well, you already have everything that you need to get started. Whatever condition you're in, you can start doing this. It might be more difficult if you don't have some of these other things, but you know, you can start from where you are. But here are some other things that, that might be helpful for you. We've mentioned teamwork, a group of adults, a clan structure of some type. If you have a group of, of willing parental figures and you also have their mentors within your system, then you kind of end up with a clan structure. So you have a group of adults and then you have their peers and their mentors. Um, so you kind of have grandparents in the system. So you have a larger clan structure. Um, to fall back on, and internal role models for the role models, if you will. But trading off caretaking can help reduce burnout and help everybody be able to pursue their own interests as well as take care of the children. The next level, like after just building a community, an internal community, would be to start repurposing that community into one focused on reparenting. Focus on internal development. So as opposed to focusing on um, the children only aging up when they come front, the young folk can grow in fits and stages, uh, given a nurturing environment. So they can, uh, they can develop and continue to get, get whatever the skills and the courage and, uh, confidence they need in order to go out into the world. You can do some inner world design as well. It was Catherine in the power of the plural system who did a self-hypnosis presentation last year that was very good talked about how to use self-hypnosis for inner world design so if you don't already know how to change things in your inner world that's one way and um, we were talking about this in our group coaching program so there's some episodes on the system speak podcast where Sasha was talking about the um, discussions we had in our group, our group coaching program, that um, we were talking about how to work on your inner world and how to redesign your inner world. So you can do inner world design. You can build a one room playhouse. You can uh, playhouse. My goodness, I'm doing well today, right? You can build a one room school room or classroom. Um, you can have a rec center, you can have a playroom, something with walls and doors so that you can close the windows, shutter everything up, and create um, a safe place for the kids where they don't know what's going on externally. So you can have adult time outside without the kids knowing what's going on, and then you can open the windows again afterwards you know, and open the door and, you know, let the breeze through and everything. And the kids can look outside and go, oh, that's what's going on externally. Okay. And then go back to playing. Um, <laughs> so um, in our headspace, we've made a nursery is what we call it, but it's, it's kind of like a preschool daycare center kind of thing or something like that. It's kind of like a daycare center and it's got like cubbies with blocks and sand table and water table and um, all kinds of things in it, like different play therapy kind of things all over the place. And um, and so the adults will, you know, guide them to put things back in their cubby and, you know, learn responsibility and so on. Um, and when needed, they'll close the windows and doors and say, okay, everybody is nap time, you know, or whatever. And, and we have privacy. So it's probably a best practice for there to be um, a, like a corner of your inner world where reparenting is a sole priority, kind of like we have that room. And that's really all that goes on in there is people make themselves available to the kids with the attachment parenting style. Um, they will make sure they get their sippy boxes and their naps and, you know, all the cuddles they want and help them care for their stuffies and you know, all that stuff all goes on in that room. And then outside of that room, we have an adjoining space, which is quote unquote outdoors. It doesn't have walls and doors and, and stuff. It's, it's never dark in there and so on. So we have an adjoining space, which is open air and, you know, as much as it can be in a spaceship. That's what we, you know, our head model is a spaceship, but it's, it's open 
to the atrium, if you will. And they can get, you know, safe exercise and explore and stuff like that. And there's a fence just to make sure they don't go wandering off and things like that. But they get, like, uh, outdoor equipment and swings and slides and sandbox and all that kind of stuff to play with. And um, maybe even a little roller coaster or two. Shh. Yeah, so we have a recreational space, if you will. So kids can grow in confidence and exploring skills and playing, you know, make, making loud noises and whatever they want to do in there. So some other examples, it might be a large playground, a kiddie amusement park, a farmyard with like toys and equipment, a petting zoo. So think about what you would want and then work on building it. The easiest way to do it is just picture building it. So what actually is reparenting, right? What is it? What is it? It's a blend of caring for, caring about, protecting, nurturing, teaching, guiding, and disciplining. It's really about it. That's what being a parent is. Reparenting is just the second chance to do it. Just doing it over again, trying the best you can, even though it's impossible, but kind of wiping the slate clean and trying to do it again. Um, kind of. <laughs> but trying to kiss the boo-boos and, and help them heal. So how much of each of these things depends really on the age and the stage of development of the person being parented. And where for younger children, you would guide them and older children, like teens or adults, you might mentor them. So the form that each of these take may transform over time as that person uh, gains a better sense of agency and, and maturity. Where do you start? Okay, so we've, we've gone through all of this, and so where do you start? What are your action steps? What do you do? I know people don't always have a very good sense of like, what do I do? So for infants and toddlers, uh, the key for them, what do they really need? The key for them is physical and emotional safety and security. They, they need to build just trust in the world. They, what they need from you is being trustworthy, your integrity, keeping your promises. They need a stable universe that builds a very strong foundation for later in life. When, when you learn that everything's not so stable. But starting out with that stable base at the very beginning is very important. Setting and forcing very healthy boundaries for them, like we have our nursery and it's safe in there. So they have that world they're fully able to explore. Um, when we give them time out in the recreation area, that world they're fully able to explore and it has boundaries. So giving them and forcing those kinds of boundaries. They wouldn't be allowed to climb the fence and try and go off on their own. And they get supervised front time. Um, so we have boundaries for that. We have somebody at their elbow who is ready to intervene if they have to, but otherwise that's, that's one of the points where we're kind of a little more hands off, but it's still attachment parenting because we're right there if they need us. So these things provide that like launch pad or nest from which they can fly off and explore life later. And another key area to pay attention with this age group is physical, emotional uh, nourishment. They just need to be nourished. These children have been hurt. So they need nourishment and they need unconditional love. That's why the attachment parenting comes in so handy because if they're a baby, they're in your arms or they're in one of those sling carriers and they're they're pressed up against your body, they feel your warmth, they hear your heartbeat. They they know you're there. They viscerally know you're there. Um where you know, once they start walking, they can come back to you as often as they need for comfort for, you know, they fall on their butt and they get scared and they need a hug and a cuddle, you're right there. At at that age, it's it's all about unconditional love and nourishment and uh and caring, caring for them. Later, that will bring them the emotional security that they need to explore all of the emotionality out in the world. We want to say also here, 
at this stage, be really cautious with disapproval. They don't have good separation, um, a good concept of things being separate from each other. So when what you feel, they feel, or they'll, you know, a baby will see another baby cry and they'll start crying because they don't have very good boundaries. Disapproval can give a child in this age group a powerful message that, that they don't, they don't matter or they're not loved anymore. Use it with older kids and we'll talk about it a little bit more, but don't do it with this age group that has a strong sense of attachment to everything around them and doesn't have a good grasp of time uh, to understand that you're only going to be upset with them for a little while. They don't get that. So children and young children. So this is kind of your, your five-year-old-ish. I mean, in, in terms of internal world, it's more looking at a developmental phase than really a number. But these are kids with growing independence, and they get very frustrated about needing to be interdependent with other people. They want to do it all. They want to do it all themselves. They get very frustrated when, when you're trying to limit them and give them boundaries. They think they can do everything. And at the same time, <laughs> they, when they overstep a boundary, they may get really scared. They're starting to work on identity at these ages. They're mimicking other people, especially their peers, or they become very susceptible at the older age, age range. They become susceptible to peer pressure. So they're kind of struggling with having an identity at this point. So for them, a good skill to have with them is to involve them with life through light physical activities like routines, chores, and responsibilities. You can always like set the stage for them at a younger age, you know, by having a routine with the child. But at this point, they're taking over more and more of that routine themselves. So giving them some responsibility can help them build self-confidence and feel involved with the family or the internal family. So don't force them to take on chores and be responsible. Instead, give them like a short list of options, no more than the number of their age. So if they're five years old, no more than five, probably less, but definitely no more than five options. <laughs> Five's a lot at that age. And then ask them which one or ones they would prefer to do to contribute. You probably want to start one at a time. So five, six, they want to be helpful, and sometimes they want their independence and freedom too. So within this age, disapproval can become a very powerful tool when you're disciplining a child, but use it very carefully. Make sure that it's the act and not the person that is the problem because their self-confidence and their, their solidifying identity is still delicate um, and can be easily crushed. So you can say, I will always love you. I just don't approve of what you did. That doesn't make you a bad person or change my love for you. So I'm going to say that one again. I will always love you. I just don't approve of what you did. That doesn't make you a bad person or change my love for you. Okay, that's kind of the attitude you got to come to at this age is, I love you very much. I don't like what you did. So let's not do that again. <laughs> so another key for this age is helping them to adapt the boundaries to match their development and ability, and also for you to adapt their permissiveness or their uh, responsibilities and so on to match their development and ability. Um, you definitely want to stretch them a little bit, but you don't want to stretch them too much and help, you know, you don't want them to feel overwhelmed, helpless, or worthless. Um, so keep repositioning and adjusting their boundaries and make sure that they're flexible. So you can loosen up on the boundaries so long as you're still monitoring them, even if it's from more of a distance, but make sure you're still monitoring their activities and where they're going and what they're doing and who they're interacting with and so on. But you can give them a little more slack. If they're fronting, I would still be at their elbow at this age. Sorry, kids. <laughs> but this would be, you know, up until they become pre-teens, maybe. 
So we talk about preteens. Preteens and younger teens, their key area is growing independence and a lot of frustration with inter interdependence. That's kind of a theme, right? You know, there's different phases where they go through that frustration with inter interdependence thing. But at this point, they're more at bucking the system than just throwing fits. Allow these children to find good role models, both internally and externally. They really need to solidify their identity at this point. They've made a lot of options. A lot of those choices are already locked and loaded at this point, but they still have more to do. So they need parenting role models and value idea, value and ideal role models so that they get their morals and their ethics straightened out and identity expression role models. So how are they, their identity gets felt out and filled in at this point. So all of these things don't need to come from the same body or the same person. So it's definitely a mix and match. Kind of like those old books where the person has a different head, middle and legs. And you flip the pages around until you make like different characters. So they make their own unique character by taking a little of this and a little of that and maybe making something up in the middle and whatever. It's also a good age to set a basic allowance, maybe, um, if that's within your means, to consider whether they should be able to earn money for doing extra chores or uh, that's above and beyond their minimum chores, which they should have had for a while now. Maybe, you know, you're like, hey, you know, if you mow the lawn, I'll give you an extra dollar a week. Um, that would be the kind of thing you would do with external children, and you can do that with internal children, if you have means. That's up to your system, something that you can discuss. Also, it still may be um, appropriate at this point to uh, limit screen time or front time, uh, or do it as a disciplinary measure. That's okay, too. It's like, you know, you didn't speak well to our friends, so you don't get to come out. You find ways of, of giving appropriate discipline to match. Um, we like to call it, uh, what did we call it? Natural consequences. When we were dealing with our external kids, it's like, well, you know, if you spilled something on the floor and didn't clean it up, now you got to clean it up and, you know, you don't get to do whatever it was that you made a mess with or um, some other kind of natural consequence that would come with that. And... Another key for this age range, the preteen and young teen, the physical equivalent would be growth spurts and changing body and lots of hormonal issues and so on. Um, these, these kids can use some more hobbies that help them develop coordination um, and deal with any dysphoria that comes up because of the mismatch between their perception of their body and your physical adult body. They may be feeling it more at this age. They may be struggling more with gender dysphoria or other body-related dysphoria. You know, I'm, I'm a teenager, but I'm in an adult body, and I'm, my knees don't match, and my arms don't match, and I'm just all out of sorts and knocking stuff down and whatever. Anyway, so when they're fronting, they may be extra clumsy, but that's also uh, just like a good get some practice type of thing. So having physical hobbies may be good for them. Um, or some extra chores, like we were saying, you know, that you could reward them for having extra chores. So give them things to kind of keep them out of trouble. Okay, so your mid to older teens and adults, um, their key is going to be adulting skills. Independence, interdependence. Hopefully at some point they stop being so mad about interdependence. They may be more in interdependent with friends or other headmates, getting used to it and liking it and so on. So the same advice for having good role models, you know, is always going to apply across of the, all of these. But, um, but now you're looking for a different type of role model. Now you want financial, parenting skills, um, adulting skill role models, and other things for, for getting more mature skills and behavior integrated into life. At some point, the thrill of being or becoming an adult is going to fade. 
And so the skill of seeking meaning in life comes in, which is kind of like, well, I'm an adult and here I am adulting and why am I doing this? <laughs> um, like what, what, what am I doing? I'm just like spinning wheels and doing the same routine over and over again. Well, that's where finding meaning in life becomes important. And part of that can also tie into impact and legacy. One of the ways of making an impact and leaving a legacy is the reparenting of our younger set. It could be making meaningful comics or giving back, being an activist. Um, it's just an extension of finding meaning in life for yourself. It's what is the meaning of your life for other people. So you might find way to, ways to become an activist, pay it forward, to give back, create art, and so on. All of these things can leave an impact and leave a legacy. So one of the things I want to do before wrapping this up is to give you an actual example of role modeling some boundaries for the children in your system. So here's some ideas. And we're going to say T for therapist a lot in this section because we've heard some inappropriate stories, some stories that are about inappropriate tea activities. And so we want to give some real world advice in this area. So address professionals by their professional title and last name. This has like a little extra boundary between you and your professional. So it's a good way to role model for children that little extra respect somebody gets for having the thing on the, the piece of paper on the wall. But it also sends a clearer message both to the child and to the T that this is a professional relationship and not a friendship. So no matter how many times the T says, well, you can just call me so-and-so with their first name, if you don't feel that's appropriate, don't do it. Find some way of keeping that professional distance in that way. Always, 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 always. This is like a boundary violation in very many ways. It is not appropriate for your therapist to touch you. This is professional guidelines. They'd be crossing a line if they touch you. So no touch and no gifts in either direction. They can't really give you a gift. You really can't give them a gift. It creates extra emotional attachments and they are a consultant and really that's it. They're not your friend. They're not a parenting figure, etc. They may know good parenting skills that they can teach you, but them knowing good parenting skills doesn't mean they should use them on you. So a good, good guideline is that nothing should go on between you and your T or your T and the kids that only a parent or a relative should do. So reading a child a story is okay, but a child being touched during the story is not. And the story needs to be an appropriate story. So in the case of the T, reading the story to the kid, the T should be reading a story that has some kind of an emotional or mental health lesson for the child or something about age-appropriate boundaries or there should be some kind of a moral to the story that it's actually a teaching story and not a story about how a T becomes a wonderful parent to this child. No, nothing like that. So it has to be appropriate. Defend your inner children just like you wish somebody had defended you as an external child. Um, or you would want to see anybody else defending an ex external child. So, for example, you might say, that's not an appropriate way to interact with our kids. Or, only internal folk get to say or do that with my children. Asking for guidance on how to do it for yourself. That can be setting up a wonderful way of role modeling to your children that you also sometimes have to ask for help and get it. So that's a great role modeling of both boundaries and asking for help when necessary. So instead of having a professional discipline or comfort or parent your child or children, ask for adult guidance to learn the skills or how to appropriately discipline the children um, or what growth milestones to look for and so on. 
and if needed, limit the tea interaction with your children. I know we all want help uh, with the, the healing process for the children, but having it come directly from the tea can cause boundary issues. So just like you would limit the tea interaction, um, you would limit other people's interaction with your children, limit your tea's interaction with your children. You would limit a doctor's interaction with your child. You only, you only go to the doctor when there's an issue. You keep an eye on them when you're, they're with your child, a physical child, sorry. You, you keep an eye on them when they're with your external child. You only take your external child to the doctor when you need to, including routine checkups that's still when you need to. But if you don't have co-consciousness with your inner children, you should prioritize that in therapy. Uh, so that you can best protect them. So definitely bump working on co-consciousness up the chain if you can't be monitoring your children and when they front. So where do you find more resources to help you to do these things, if you will? We would recommend uh, childhood development books and charts and so on. You may have to do some translation of the developmental milestones that are intended for external kids to apply them to internal kids. But most of the time, it's not that hard, not that far-fetched. So you can get some generic uh, guidance and you can consult, you can consult with uh, developmental aids, you know, like cheat sheets and whatever. Um, and you can talk about childhood development with your professional team and ask them questions. There are some free and otherwise parenting classes you can do like through video courses and whatever. If you're really interested, go ahead, watch some videos on parenting milestones and childhood development and good parenting skills and all the parenting styles that I mentioned. Some of these things will translate very easily. And other things won't, and so you've got to kind of pick and choose. Um, but there are some great resources out there to help parents learn better parenting skills. It's also like online magazines like parenting.com. Take everything with a grain of salt, discuss it with other plurals, talk to your tea, and adapt the information so that it works within your system and it works for you. We have the United Front Boot Camp. It's a blog on our website, kinhost.org, and it's free. And occasionally there's like a podcast episode that ties back into one of the um, blog articles. So we kind of went into the same topic in depth many, many years later. So you might uh, click through and listen to some of our podcast episodes. So there are episodes and blog articles that work on um, internal community development in general, and sometimes we have some age-appropriate issue articles um, talking about specific things on settling disputes with internal children or sharing responsibility, Im improving internal relationships, discipline, boundaries internally so that people aren't like bugging each other too much and so on. So we're going to have a new episode, hopefully by the time this comes out, on our podcast on reparenting. It was recorded a year ago, so it shouldn't be too hard. Uh, so we will hopefully publish that before the conference so that you can go back and listen to that. And it's very different con content than this presentation. There may be a couple things we mentioned that are the same because we're the same people, but it is a very different podcast. So, um, so we will have that and that all can be found through kinhost.org. And we have a group coaching program where we're going to do a six-week six week program on uh, reparenting skills coming up, and, um, and we're going to have several other sessions on different topics. And that's all on our liberatedlifecoaching.com website. There's an application process to join, and the homepage will uh, tell you whether or not the application process is still open at the moment or not. And if it's not, we offer a waiting list, so you can sign up on the waiting list, and we will put you on a list. And that's it. We thank you for joining us for our presentation. And we really hope that this information has been helpful for you and that you take really good care of yourselves and enjoy the conference. <laughs>